Welcome, everyone. This is a panel that has been organized by the American Association of University Professors, University of Washington chapter, AAUP, I'll call it for short. And AAUP is a 99-year-old organization at the University of Washington. And our job, as I see it, is supporting academic freedom. Now, this has a lot of different facets. And I think that what we're doing today is really an important part of that. Uh, it says on some of our promotional material that I'm the vice president of the AAUP, but that's a, a little bit of a misnomer. I'm the vice president of mailing lists. My role is uh, an executive committee member, but especially the one who moderates our AAUP mailing list. And uh, did I mention we have a mailing list that I'm the moderator of? It has 2,000 people on it, and you don't have to be a university professor to join it. Anyone is welcome to join it. And it has a fascinating and robust discussion, although I'm sometimes accused of censorship. Also, uh, if you are a university professor, or if you're a university graduate student, please join us. The AAUP is a member-based organization, and your membership makes what we do possible. Uh, for those of you who are members of the AAUP in the audience, thank you for making this possible. Everyone else who could help us make this possible, I hope you enjoy this, and I hope you decide to continue to decide to join and help us in the future. Uh, AAUP has recently revisited and developed our strategic agenda, and I'm going to tell you what it is before we get to our panel. It has three points. First of all, building a climate safe for academic freedom amidst increasing political polarization. Secondly, to roll back the divisions of academic labor that weaken professional independence. And third, restoring university funding while resisting privatization. I would put this in the academic freedom category, although it connects with many other things that we're trying to do. Um, now, a point about process, you know, uh, what's happening in here, a request or even a plea, really, I would like you to try to stay off your devices during this talk. And this is just a challenge for all of us in this modern age because we have all of the information in the world as it happens in our pockets. But it kind of gets in the way of interactions if we're really tuned out of the world around us and into the world in our pocket. Also, I would like to ask you not to film for the same reason. We have Mike McCormick recording this for us, and we're going to make a great recording of this available online for everyone afterwards. I hope that there's great stuff that happens here that everyone leaves saying, I've got to share that with somebody. Share it from this recording that uh, we're going to make for you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this panel. Uh, it was not the entirety of the AAUP UW who put it together. In fact, there were really three members of the ad hoc panel, and I'd like to just call them out and thank them now. Amy Hagopian, Bert Stover, and Diane Morrison really made this happen. Thank you so much. I'll thank them again at the end, and we'll see if we still clap. Uh, so to frame things a little bit, where are we in the world today? You know, it's hard to prepare for an event like this because we had weeks of lead up to it, but. The world changes so quickly now that it's hard to know what the point of departure for a conversation will be. President Trump is in Palestine today. Yesterday, he might have leaked additional secret information on his way there. ISIS claimed responsibility for a deadly attack on a pop concert in the UK. Here in Washington state, there's a new bill that's been proposed that would make it illegal to wear a mask or cover your face in public, with, with certain exceptions. And uh, on the other hand, I'm surprised people clap for that, but that represents the diversity of opinions in the room. I, I was thinking of something good to counterbalance that, but we'll see who claps, that today the World Health Organization elected a new head, Dr. Tedros, who's the first director general from Africa. I, I think this is a wild world that we're living in. And so it's in this context that we can come together to talk, in my opinion, really about how we continue to do 
the things that I think we want to do at a university. And we've got a huge panel, and I want to give you a brief introduction to everyone who's on it, and then start hearing from them in turn for, you know, seven minutes per person about the events on the inauguration day, before, during, after this shooting, and about what they think we should know about it. I'll give them each a, a more detailed introduction before we hear from them directly, but there are current UW students on this panel, Jack Pickett, Alan Michael Weatherford, Ruby Byrne, as well as UW alums Anna Sophia Knopf and Sean McBessel. Uh, also, we have Venkat Balasubramani from the ACLU and John Walker from the Industrial Workers of the World. As I said, I'll give each of them a bit more of an introduction as we hear from them. But let me also add that we invited a few additional people. Despite how large this panel is, there are so many people we want to hear from about it. And it seems appropriate to say who chose not to appear. The lawyer for the accused shooters chose not to appear, as well as the UW Provost Jerry Baldesty and the UW Police Major Steve Rittersreyer. So on that note, let us turn to our panelists. And while they're speaking, I encourage you to think of questions that you want me to pose to them later and to write these down on index cards and circulate them to my fellow AAUP members who have volunteered to help collect them and get them up here so that I can ask uh, as we go. Um, our first panelist today is Jack Pickett. He's a sophomore at the University of Washington studying political science and Spanish. He's a member of the UW College Republicans. And he sits on the state board of the Washington College Republican Federation. Uh, Jack was the youngest delegate from Washington State to the 2016 Republican National Convention. And this summer, he'll be an intern in the DC office of Congressional Representative Dan Newhouse. I would like to start with Jack and with the events that his group convened when my professor colleagues were discussing the appropriateness uh, of a response of some sort to this event, I suspect that many wondered, and one even emailed our list to ask directly, what was the reasoning for inviting a speaker with the reputation for generating conflict? I think Jack is going to help us understand this now, and I also invite him to share anything else that he wants us to know. I will, like A.B. said, my name is Jack Pickett, and um, also, like he said, I am just completing my first year at the university. I'm a sophomore in credits, I guess, and I've been a member of the College Republicans for uh, the last year and all those other things that he said. Um, just to get started, I really want to thank the AAUP and A.B. and uh, Amy and everyone else that I know put a lot of hard work into this panel. I think this is a really important uh, conversation for us to have in trying to uh, you know, move on from events like uh, the those that occurred on uh, inauguration night and and to really improve our society so um, I do want to address the question that I'm sure uh, most of you in this room have as to why the college Republicans invited Milo uh, and I'll get there I will I promise within seven minutes um, if I can um, but first I want to just talk a little bit about free speech and why it's important especially on uh, a college campus um, and I'm sure it seems pretty intuitive to most of you, but I think sometimes we miss some of the, uh, the details. So I just kind of want to talk about that real quick. So the first reason that free speech is important is because uh, it allows you to be who you are. It allows you to express what you feel and what you believe. Uh, and if you can't do that, if you can't express yourself and express what you believe, um, at least from my point of view, life is essentially meaningless. Uh, in addition, um, the right to free speech is the key to all other rights that we possess as human beings and as Americans. Uh, it is the foundation for all liberty uh, because it allows us to voice our concerns uh, and to protest abuses of power. It protects, uh, it protects us um, in more ways than one. It's also a protection for minority rights uh, the governing majority, as a result of the First Amendment provision of free speech, cannot silence minority opposition. 
the reason that it's particularly important on college campuses is because college campuses are the place where discourse and discussion, uh, hopefully open discourse and discussion, um, and debate about conflicting ideals is supposed to occur. And the reason that we hope that those debates will occur on college campuses is because college campuses shape the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, the changes we want to see our society achieve start right here in places like the University of Washington, in rooms like Kane 110. Uh, and with the advent of safe space culture and free speech zones, that discourse is being threatened. Um, and that's not good for America, and that's not good for our future as a society. So the big million dollar question, why did the college Republicans invite Milo Yiannopoulos uh, when he has such a controversial uh, reputation? Well, first of all, you need to understand the context of the situation. Uh, we were aware that Milo was doing a nationwide tour of, the, of uh, colleges in the United States, and uh, he became very well known in the months leading up to January 20th when he came and spoke here, uh, and he had achieved quite a level of notoriety. And being the largest and most prestigious uh, university in the Northwest, uh, we felt it was only appropriate that he should visit this university uh, and speak to our students. Um, we also knew that he would attract an audience. And as an organization on a college campus, one of our goals is to grow our membership and spread our ideology. That's the goal of any political club. And so by bringing Milo, we knew that we would be able to uh, make contact with people who we otherwise might not ever get to speak to. Um, the most important point, though, in why we invited Milo was because we wanted to make a very specific point. We wanted to challenge the notion that you have the right to be free from speech that you disagree with or that is offensive to you. Whether you love Milo or hate him, whether you agree with him or find him appalling, he has a right to say what he thinks and what he believes. Most conservatives, and I am one of these conservatives, would agree that even if I vehemently disagree with you or something that you say or believe, I will fight till the end to protect your right to say that, what you believe. Uh, and historically, this has been something that our country has been unified around. It's a hallmark of American democracy. And the idea that this generation wants to silence any idea we disagree with is troubling to us, and we wanted to push back against that idea. So that's what Milo was meant to accomplish. Now, obviously, the response to Milo was violent, and that's troubling and disappointing to all of us, including college Republicans. But we're going to continue to advocate for free speech because it is so vitally important to the success of our society and our nation. The solution is not to silence people that we disagree with, but obviously something has got to change. So what do I think has to change? What's, what's next? How do we move on? Well, I can sum it up pretty simply. We need to respect and honor each other even when we vehemently disagree with each other. We can't just sit behind a screen or stand behind a mask and say terrible things about people we disagree with. We need to return the humanity to politics. And um, that's because change, societal change, institutional change, any type of change happens at the speed of relationships. There is a person on the other side of every ideology, even the ideologies that we most disagree with. Um, and we've got to remember that fact, and we have to uh, make individual, individually, we have to make the decision to respect the humanity of those we disagree with. Because when we, dis, when we dehumanize everyone we disagree with, that reduces the legitimacy that true evil exists in this world, and it diminishes our ability to stand against it united when it does occur. So um, that's all I have, and I'm going to pass it off. Thanks for listening to me. Thank you very much, Jack. And not in the least for keeping to time. Um, I think we're going to go on to a number of other speakers. But before we do, uh, I want to share something that inspired me from a, a book about having crucial conversations. And this sounds like, uh, I don't know, after school special kind of stuff. But it's worked for me so well. 
that in a tough situation like this, I can't help but say it. Because when a crucial conversation happens, it's very hard to use the slow thinking, rational part of our brains to do it. And this book has a formula that works for me. You say, what do I want for myself? And what do I want for this other person? And if this is what I want, what should I do right now? And every time I'm really in an emotional space in a conversation, I think at first I think like, well, I want me to win and I want them to disappear from the planet and I want to execute that dream. And then that's not really what I want. So that's why I like this formula so much because then I say, no, no, no. That would be an unacceptable approach. Really, what is it that I want for me? And uh, I, I just put that out there in case it's helpful to anyone else. Uh, enough about me. Our next speaker is Alan Michael Weatherford. And uh, if you could pass the mic down to him. Alan Michael is a graduate student at the University of Washington and a member of AWDU, the Academic Workers for a Democratic Union, which is a caucus of the Grad Student Union. AWDU works for a member-driven union for all academic student workers. Despite not attending the event on January 20th, and not taking part in any protest during the event, Alan Michael was harassed following the event for his participation in a guerrilla teach-in held in Odegaard Library on the same day. He described his experience in a guest editorial in the UW Daily entitled, Being Harassed in the Wake of Milo. This sort of harassment makes me think hard about the limits of speech. And I'd like now to give Alan Michael a chance to tell us about his experience, and also to tell us what he thinks we need to know when we consider how we can do better in the future. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, so I have a little something prepared here that I was going to read. Um, so the question of free speech is at base an intellectually bankrupt project that because of its framing shifts the focus from an analysis and understanding of material labor. I'm currently not interested at all in the mediocrity and lack of analysis that the college Republicans leverage and even relish in. In fact, I think our intellectual inquiries and projects are better pursued elsewhere and have already been so, yet we have continued to ignore them. Free speech is a liberal device, a vestige of the European Enlightenment created in response to the unchecked power of monarchies. In other words, it helped give birth to and protect the individual from the government. Today, however, it is used and co-opted by conservatives and especially the alt-right to rationalize violence against minoritized folks. I have had innumerable conversations with people that want to talk about this, yet have either read little to no work on the matter, and if they have, they typically refuse to acknowledge the lived experiences and even the scholarly work of those most affected by it. In fact, I would like to point out the composition of this panel as a case in point. There is a lack of representation by those who are most affected, and disproportionately so. I am speaking in particular about undocumented, immigrant, feminine identified, and queer people of color. What has happened to me, in my case of doxing, is actually a daily occurrence for others who do not share the privileges of my own positionality. Moreover, their voices go completely unread and unheard. It is this active cultivation of ignorance and rehearsal of the free speech debate that I want to forego. I want to reframe our thinking as an issue of labor, a part of the contradictory demands of liberal capital as it pertains to minoritized people. The questions primarily posed for this panel were, quote, what did we learn and what would we do differently? In part, I think these questions are, to be quite blunt, a slap in the face to so many who have already put in that work, that intellectual labor. Yet we have chosen to discount and ignore that work, a symptom of liberal capital's contradictory logic. I want those of you here to think about how much uh, critical legal studies, critical race theory, black feminism, and queer of color work you have read and actively use in your own scholarly endeavors and daily interactions. I want you to reflect on how much the labor of your fellow minoritized faculty members are reflected in their pay, in their recognition as scholars. I want you to ponder how the lack of you citing them contributes to the systemic exclusion of their knowledge production. 
I want you to focus on the contradiction of liberal capital that once minoritized labor, yet does not substantially engage with their work, build off of their findings. We use and capitalize on their aesthetics as a means to sell diversity on our brochures, programs, newsletters, emails, and events, yet do not give that money back to them at all. In the age of neoliberal multiculturalism, we bring in minoritized folks to produce knowledge even about their own communities, yet we do not want to provide the resources they need for their material support, especially when they come under fire. We set up the conditions for, as in my case, the very real harassment and threats of death, and then rationalize it. I was brought here to the university to teach the courses that I do, to do the research that I do. Yet when very blatantly attacked, I am told that I am quote unquote too public, and there is nothing anyone can do. I am told that I am limiting free speech. It is this logical contradiction of liberal capital, of again bringing in minoritized folks for labor with the abstract promise of protection, yet the full-on denial of material support that not only produces violence, but rationalizes it. Part of that rationalization is the denial of history, the assumption that our current moment is one where we all come to the table together on equal footing. However, we do not acknowledge whose house it is that we enter, who spent the time building the table, who set the agenda, and whose knowledge production we are all educated in. To be explicit, we do not acknowledge who has built the state or the university, who spent the time building the law or the rules and regulations, who set the terms of the debate and whose knowledge we were all educated in. But we are the inheritors of a colonial system of exploitation. We do not all come to the table equally. We exist in and through power. If you want to know what really happened, we set up the conditions for someone to get shot, for our most vulnerable to be left to their own devices, and then we rationalized it. We looked them in the face after so many voiced their concerns and actively turned away, and then we convened a reactionary panel, never listening to the screams of those being most affected, in order to further rationalize it. Uh, thank you very much, Alan Michael. Um, I think we'll go through all of the panelists and then uh, get into questions. Um, and so I would like now to uh, pass the mic over to Anna Sophia Kanoff, uh, who is a journalist for the Seattle Alt Weekly, The Stranger. She's a graduate of the UW Journalism Program and the author of articles on the UW, the Inauguration Day event, and Civil Liberties, including the recent article, What is Free Speech Anyway? As a journalist covering this event, she has had a chance to talk to a variety of people who were present during the event, and she also has the job of thinking these things through and writing them down. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us, Anna Sophia, and I wonder, what would you like people to know? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Anna Sophia Knauf. Um, I'm technically the neighborhood's reporter for The Stranger. Um, I ended up covering this as well as the rest of our news team did on Inauguration Day. Um, we were dispatched across the town to cover Inauguration Day events, and I happened to attend the uh, guerrilla teach-in here at UW where I met Alan Michael. Um, so I was not here for the actual events that transpired outside of the Milo Yiannopoulos talk that evening, um, but it was everywhere the next day. Um, there were people pointing fingers, and there were um, people looking for someone to blame. And I think that that's a natural reaction to that, and we have to acknowledge that that is a way that we react when things are um, out of our control. And in looking at all of this, um, I've had my, I feel like my thoughts about free speech and looking at this event have been kind of all over the map. Um, I, as a journalist, um, part of my job is emboldened and is enabled by the First Amendment and free speech. Um, it allows the freedom of the press. Um, and so that, to me, is a vital part of um, the construction of our country. Um, however, as a woman of color and as a woman in general, 
Uh, um, I do see the ways that free speech limit us um, and also leave vulnerable populations such as other um, folks of color as well as LGBTQ plus individuals um, in, vulnerable, in a vulnerable position um, to be exploited um, and or harmed. Um, uh, looking at the shooting at the UW, um, I guess before I want to go any further, I want to give uh, very much due credit to um, Mike Carter and Steve Militich at the Seattle Times, um, who broke the news um, concerning Mark Hokoana and his wife Elizabeth Hokoana, um, and just generally trying to unpack what the heck happened that evening. Um, I got to look at this from the outside, which is a challenge in and of itself. I'm just trying to make sense of what happened and also putting it into context um, to understand how this makes sense in the current country that we live in. Um, I think for a lot of us, um, we're scared um, and we're looking for ways to capital R resist, right? Um, and I think that that's a noble endeavor, especially when you are concerned about the person who is in charge of this country. Um, and the people that his presidency has emboldened. Um, one of the things that I think that the university could have done better, I don't even want to start arguing about um, Milo, why, my, why or how we could have prevented Milo coming here because that happened. But looking ahead at potential um, other speakers who could be coming to the university in the future, I think it's important for us to, us and for the university, to recognize that they are a home um, for these vulnerable populations, that they are a home to undocumented students, to international students, to um, queer students, and to many others who are affected by the presence of um, not even conservatives, but ultra right wingers who come in from across the country to participate in these events. And I think that that's a real issue, and we're seeing that. Um, at the Berkeley protests that have transpired since April. We see people come in from across the country to participate or at least be in the audience of um, these events to stand up for their free speech rights, which you addressed. Um, and I think while people do have the right to ex exercise free speech, I think universities also have the responsibility to acknowledge that these types of groups do come in from across the country to band together. Um, and to give vulnerable students adequate warning that that is happening. Um, and UW, although Anna Marie Kause, the president of this university, did mention um, multiple times via blog posts and emails that this is happening, the university has to stand up for free speech as a public institution. Um, I think that the university and her administration could have done better by those vulnerable, vulnerable students by giving them proper notification that these groups were headed their, our way. Thank you so much, Anna Sophia. Um, and to me, I, I'm trying not to editorialize so that we can hear so much from our panelists, but this just connects so much to the AAUP challenge of how do we run a university, you know? How can we restore funding to the university, resist privatization, and yet deal with all of these conflicting tensions. Groups from around the country finding this as a, a rallying point for, let's call it, their extreme political beliefs. But I'm going to continue with speakers and not take up your time, excuse me. Uh, and our next speaker is Ruby Byrne. Uh, and if you could pass the mic to her, I would appreciate it. She is a PhD candidate at ph in physics at the University of Washington. She's also a union representative for the Graduate Student Union, and she was present at the protest as a protester. I greatly appreciate her be being here today to tell us about what she saw and what she experienced at the event, as well as the other things she thinks that we should know going forwards. Thank you, Ruby. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Ruby Byrne. Um, yeah, this is my first time speaking on a panel. I wasn't really sure what the format would be, so I don't have a well-prepared uh, little spiel, but I'm gonna say some things and hopefully be brief. Um, so yeah, I did attend the protest as a protester. Um, I had heard about Milo and about his speech. I was particularly troubled by um, his speech at the University of Wisconsin when he 
outed and targeted a trans student there, um, and the harassment she experienced as a result of Milo's speech uh, led her to withdraw from her university. Um, so I felt a moral obligation to uh, attend the event on January 20th to protest his speech uh, because I think that kind of hate speech is completely unacceptable. And I think as Jack noted, I wanted to express myself and what I believe because I don't want my life to be meaningless. Um, anyway, um, so on that note, I'm glad we're having these discussions, but it also seems um, pretty surreal to be here speaking about this um, on a panel in which the uh, lawyer for the shooter was invited, but there were no students of color invited, no trans students invited, and no immigrant or undocumented students invited. So I want to be very clear that these are the people who are most affected by these situations on campus. And so I'm here to speak uh, sort of second hand to the sorts of oppression that those people face. Um, but I want everyone to understand that I have a lot of privilege as a white person on this campus. Um, so yeah, just making that very clear from the outset. Um, okay, so um, I think the probably most valuable thing that can happen right now is for us to talk about concrete ways that the university can protect marginalized people on this campus. And those are people who are uh, marginalized by their identities and are further marginalized by university policies that put them at risk. Um, so first off, I want to talk a little bit about the police response on January 20th, which was uh, severely lacking. Um, so when we see a lot of the protests that are going on with protesters and counter protesters, it seems pretty typical that the uh, police form a line between them and try to separate them. Um, anyone who was present on January 20th knows that that was the opposite of what the police did. They made a circumference around both uh, the Milo at, uh, attendees and the protesters and then used their bikes to violently push protesters into the crowd of people lined up to see Milo. So this was, um, you know, just made a tense situation uh, much more volatile and was uh, very unhelpful. So I was when the shooting actually occurred, I was standing pretty far away. I didn't hear the gunshot or anything like that. Um, but I heard calls for a medic for several minutes. Um, I was standing right in front of a police line, so I know that if I was hearing those calls, the police certainly were as well. Um, after several minutes of hearing these calls, I sort of meandered over to see what the situation was. Um, there had still not been a police response to the fact that there was a shooting. Um, and they didn't show up for several more minutes. Uh, once they did respond to the shooting, there was no attempt to communicate to the crowd what was going on, so there was a lot of confusion and fear about that. Um, there was no active shooter protocol um, followed. There was no attempt to detain the shooter. Um, and the crime scene was not cleared, so when I left the scene later, there were literally people walking through a pool of blood on Red Square. <laughs> So this, uh, I don't, yeah, it was extremely upsetting and it's affected me very deeply and I can only imagine how much it's affected uh, Hex, the victim of the shooting and his loved ones. Um, but I also wanna tie this into a greater climate on campus in which uh, police are used to kind of solve all uh, safety concerns on campus. And UW PD has a known history of racial profiling and biased policing. This is something that has been addressed for years long before I arrived at UW. Um, they're being criticized for lacking literacy in racial equity and queer issues. Uh, there's been no response to many calls by students to have better training around these issues. Um, furthermore, uh, when people come to UW PD with an issue that is not something the police can address, they're not appropriately uh, referred to the folks who can address those issues. Uh, so an example of this is Safe Campus. Safe Campus is a non-police alternative uh, to promote student safety on campus. Up until recently, it was severely understaffed with something like one staff person. Um, UW is very proud that they have gotten safe campus staffing up to a full staffing level, whatever that is. 
but now many of the other resources that Safe Campus is supposed to refer people to are severely understaffed. So someone with a problem will go to Safe Campus and be referred to an office where no one is there. Um, and essentially, uh, this has been a big problem for people accessing uh, the resources they need on campus. Uh, furthermore, UW has done very little to protect international students who are affected by the travel bans. Uh, this is something that my union is working on right now. Um, there's been no attempt by the university to reach out to these students after the travel bans have been in effect. Uh, the only message coming from the university is that those students should not travel. Um, so my union is attempting to earn protections and are getting basically nothing from the university. Um, Anyway, so those are some of the points I wanted to make. Um, essentially, there have been a lot of issues with students and workers on this campus being targeted, uh, like Alan Michael, being harassed, uh, having unsafe circumstances in their classrooms. And I think the university response has been really egregious and not ensuring these people's safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruby. <clears throat> um, next, if you could pass the mic all the way down to the end, we'll hear from Venkat Bala Subramani. Venkat Bala Subramani is a First Amendment's lawyer, and he frequently does pro bono work with the American Civil Liberties Union. He also started a boutique law firm focused on technology and internet law clients. Uh, and it's really great to have you as a legal panel, a legal expert on our panel today. Uh, I want to ask from your perspective and from an ACLU perspective, what is it that you think we need to know? And if you can, specifically, what are considerations that we need to pay attention to since we're a university, and since we're a public university at that? Um, well, thanks for having me on the panel. I am probably a poor substitute for the defense lawyer who was invited and who couldn't participate. But um, a quick 30 second on me and my background. Uh, I'm a lawyer, kind of a garden variety First Amendment lawyer, which uh, I'm thankful to be. I mean, it's a fun, incredibly interesting area of work. And um, I've done cases ranging from a uh, politician accused of lying under a false political advertising statute who was a Green Party candidate to bus advertising dispute involving um, Israel foreign policy bus ad that was pulled after a protest to um, a photographer who was detained for uh, photographing power lines. And um, in my private capacity as a non-ACLU lawyer, I was also tangentially involved in a Gamergate uh, case that kind of spilled over into Washington. Um, one of the kind of uh, participants in, um, in the whole episode actually moved to Washington from Boston and sought a restraining order against um, this, this guy who I think kind of was originally was the initial subject of everything, and um, I represented him pro bono uh, and, and sort of fought the attempt to get a restraining order against him. So my, spe my efforts kind of span the political spectrum, and, and that's definitely one message that I think it's important that uh, I talked to Jack about before the panel, which is you know free speech is not a left, right, or a Democrat, uh, Republican issue. It's kind of a, just an issue that spans the political spectrum. Um, I think Alan raised some really interesting critiques about the system, and um, interestingly, the language of the First Amendment is um, is marketplace-based or marketplace-driven, and so um, I think his his comments were thought-provoking and deserve uh, deserve a second look. But that said, um, you know I'm sort of a participant in the system and 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 work within it and and take it at face value. And um, I don't actually work for the ACLU. I do a lot of pro bono work for the ACLU. And so uh, they send me out to uh, speaking engagements as they do other lawyers who, who work for them. Um, as far as my take on this, um, I think I come from a classic uh, more speech is better point of view. And um, you know, speech is most effective when it stirs people into action. And the idea that um, a, a speaker can be disinvited from a university because people don't like the message he or she uh, espouses is deeply distressing to me. And I'm sort of surprised there's not more 
um, of a visceral negative reaction to it. Um, it's just, I think the, the, the slippery slope effects are um, just, you, you don't even have to think about them. I mean, I think the kind of speakers that get disinvited range the spectrum from, um, you know, pro-Palestine, you know, speakers to what have you. And it sort of depends on who raises the biggest hue and cry and who the, the institution decides to listen to is uh, results in who, who ends up being disinvited. So I think I, I really want to resist the idea that uh, we can disinvite people because we don't like their message. Um, but I acknowledge it's a complicated issue. I don't, I don't think it's sort of um, so black and white that we, we can just stay there and, and stop at that. Um, I think peaceful protest is, uh, is obviously acceptable and important and as is decorum, but you know, what I come down to is that to the extent that um, people use a negative reaction to try to get rid of a speaker, that easily translates into viewpoint discrimination, and which I think is a very core First Amendment value, which is the person in charge could today de decide they don't like Milo, but tomorrow could decide they don't like Hillary Clinton. Um, and so I think uh, that said, I don't want to, 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 to sort of cast aside the effects of the speech. I think there are a lot of harmful effects of um, so negative speech, and, and I don't want to minimize it. But I, I don't think, especially for a Milo I don't, or, or, or somebody who, who fits that bill, I don't think disinviting him is the appropriate reaction. That's not to say that if he's doxing or if he's working on a coordinated campaign to engage in particularly harmful acts directed at somebody, he should be held accountable for that. But I, I really, really worry about the idea of conflating what these these other acts that occur with well let's just disinvite him entirely and i think i would urge everybody to take a really close look at um w when we hear stuff about you know people being doxxed and outed and i think we have a good example of somebody offering a first-hand example here in the audience um i think a lot often gets lost in translation and and to the extent milo has actually done something he should be held accountable but at the same time i'm again i'm really uncomfortable with the idea that he should be disinvited just because um you know one of his associates might have engaged in activity that um you know is, is harmful is admittedly harmful and i think the spillover effects of uh to the message are, are, are really difficult. And from a First Amendment standpoint, something I really worry about. As far as what uh, the police could have done differently, I think Hannah brought up good points that um, keeping people separate is important and educating and training uh, law enforcement or whomever is involved in the efforts to, to keep the peace are uh is is really important and, and i think something i touch on in my practice that's that's really interesting to me that i wish i had more time to think about is how the internet changes things and uh whether that's organizing a far-flung protest or barraging somebody with messages that um, i know journalists who you know who get routinely death threats and um, that's not necessarily something that maybe happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago so i i will admit that um, that that might change the dynamic, and I think that uh, warrants additional thought. So I don't have any good answers, I think, um, but I come from the typical more speech is uh, best, and um, particularly in a university campus that's an institution of learning where a debate of ideas is w what uh, keeps people moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Venkat. <clears throat> If we can send the mic again across, this time to Sean uh, McFessel, uh, who I'll introduce. Sean is a professor of English at Highline College, and he's a graduate of the UW Rhetoric and Composition program. And he's an author. Most recently, he's author of the book, Nonviolence Ain't What It Used To Be, Unarmed Insurrection and the Rhetoric of Resistance. And Sean, I, I think, that uh, I might be like many others in my intuitive support for free speech, kind of the way ACLU and the College Republicans think about it. And I, I think that you're someone who's thought deeply about this and perhaps come to a different conclusion uh, than the, the sort of 
intuitive spot where I start. So I'd like to know what you think we should know uh, based on this and in general to be better prepared the next time we face a challenge like this. Okay, thanks Abby, um, and thanks Amy and the organizers for the event. Um, it's good to air these things out. Um, first of all, I was also at the event, and I actually was right next to the shooting, um, and I'd be happy to talk about that in Q&A. And I also just wrote this book about protest, um, peaceful and otherwise, and kind of taking another look at how we understand that. And I think the way that I approach that is actually a little bit similar to the way that I approach free speech. I mean, it's sort of hard to say, like, I'm against, you know, anybody's against free speech, but it's also really hard to say what we're talking about when we're talking about free speech. So I think what I'm going to try to blow through in the next six and a half minutes um, is some reframing of that to at least get us thinking about it. Um, one thing I guess I would start with is just to think about some of the consequences, because I think speech is consequential. Speech is generally already an action, and just like we judge other actions, we might have to take those into account. Some of the things that I would claim have, some of the things that have happened on campus since J20 that I believe actually are kind of directly linked, and people participating in these and suffering these things have, have linked to the um, fact that the university, after months of escalation and hundreds of, of pleadings from um, many, from students and faculty not to allow this to occur because we predicted exactly this would happen. Um, I just want to list off a few of the things that have happened um, that I know about and things have been really not reported and, and sort of scattered so I think a lot, I, don't, I don't even know half of it I think. I know a grad student who approached me and said that she left because she had a white supremacist student who s said when the shooting happened that he was going to do the same in the classroom um, and she sought help from the administration and they told her to see a counselor. Her car windows were smashed out, um, and when she attempted to get um, recognition of that, they again dismissed her. Um, so she left her PhD, she walked away. Another student I know um, refused her. She was really looking forward to entering a medical program here, and then after the changing culture of the last several months, she's like better not actually considering, particularly for marginalized students, the atmosphere, the climate that we're faced with. Um, Alan Michael, obviously, um, I would recommend everybody here before they pass judgment read the article that he wrote for The Stranger um, about what he went through. A uh, known sort of fascist sympathizer on campus went into the queer center, the Q Center, with a six inch knife screaming. Um, and as far as I know, wasn't reprimanded. Anamari had not heard of the event um, when approached. There's a number of undocumented students who were threatened. They were actually running for a government um, office, and they were threatened very publicly with death threats and rape threats. Repeatedly, they took those to the administration, and those were dropped. Um, flyers went up around on campus with pictures from Latin America in the 70s when leftist organizer students were, were um, drugged, had their stomachs slid open, and were thrown into the ocean from helicopters. And there were flyers all over campus. I, I kind of wonder how older faculty from Latin America felt seeing those, um, and a lot more. Um, maybe I'll stop with those. I don't want to use my whole time to talk about that. We also, I mean, in, oh, I'm sorry, I have to tell one more story because this is emblematic, um, and I think this really gets to the question about free speech that we we're hearing about. There was also a performance of As You Like It with majority um, people of color cast. During the performance, a lot of you may have heard this, during the performance, the um, the theater was plastered with, was weed pasted with flyers from the group Atomwaffen um, that said, yellow, black, and brown, get out of our town. Seattle needs an ethnic cleansing. Um, the UW PD, when they, faced, when they were faced with those, they said, well, we're a free speech campus. So um, some people will like that, some people will not, but that's up to them to decide. And if they don't like it, they should stay away from it. So I'm going to claim that actually free speech has always had, you know, love it or hate it, free speech is only so, just like anything else, because it has limits on the meaning of it. And I would claim, for example, that last one is just absurd to claim is protected speech by any measure, even a very liberal law. I'm not talking any radical standards here. Um, incidentally, that group Adam Woffen that the UWPD was very proud to host the flyers of was just found, one of the members shot and killed two members yesterday in Florida, and they were found hosting, um, they, had, they had radioactive materials used to make a nuclear weapon in their home. You can read the papers about that. That was yesterday. You can sneer, but it's there. Um, so please look it up in the papers. That's what we're talking about. I mean, there's, so there's consequences with this stuff. There was also, I, I could talk this whole time about this, I have to stop, but in the greater Seattle area, there was basically a lynching of Ben Keita, 18-year-old black um, 
Muslim teen, and immediately he was found hanging like 30 feet up. Um, clearly a lynching type murder. I'm assuming we'll find out someday by, by a Nazi type, but the police and FBI said it was probably a suicide despite the objections of his family and the clear conditions of it. Um, oh, a mosque was burned down locally, repeated vandaliz vandalizing with Holocaust denial and bomb threats made to synagogues, Jewish community centers. Um, you know, and I, people are connecting these to the atmosphere that was opened up with inviting Milo. So that's the first thing we have to think about is what are the actual consequences and do we judge this as we, oh my God, <laughs> as we judge other actions. Um, I'm gonna breeze through, I used up most of my time telling horror stories. Um, I, I have an extended quote from here. I mean, I think the thing is, it's not just exceptional, like all the time people don't get to talk. That's normal. Kane Hall's a big place, it's expensive, right? And it's not like, a lot of people have a lot to say, a lot of people have stuff to say that we'd like to hear. The there's a difference between a platform and the legal right to free speech. The First Amendment guarantees that the government is not going to interfere with content, right? It doesn't say any douche who has some stupid stuff to say gets to have Tegan Hall, right? Um, so, I mean, even on this campus, Super uh, Students United for Palestinian Equal Rights was threatened with being disbanded as a group because they had more than three signs up on a lawn. Um, I know people, there was uh, locally, um, Josh Harper was sentenced, people are sentenced to, to, um, to prison for far less. Um, Josh Harper was a local environmental activist who, um, who he, I have this quoted, <laughs> I mean, I'll read it in the Q&A if you want. Um, he had a ton of his, of his speech engagements canceled on college campuses, pressured not to, local groups pressured not to talk. This happens routinely. I want to bring up very clearly, maybe this is a good thing to end on without saying the half second half of things I wanted to say. Um, the Gamergate controversy is a, is a really good example. By protecting the right of the, of the people that are making the death threats and said that they were gonna kill all the people that came to hear Anita Sarkeesian give her talks on college campuses, her entire tour got canceled. So where's Anita Sarkeesian's rise of free speech? Where's the, where's the free speech of the people coming to hear it? You know, I think it's, we use these magic words to cover up what the actual content is, what the actual conversation is, and with Milo, I mean, I remember a time when, you, when liberals were saying, you know, obviously you can't have Holocaust denialism. Obviously you can't have in Kane Hall a Ku Klux Klan rally or something. I don't actually, I'm not even sure what the standards are anymore, and I'm not sure that people would argue we couldn't. Um, okay. Um, I would love to talk more about this, the Q&A. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's one more point I have to make. This is what I'm going to link up, sorry. Um, Colleges also limit speech all the time. This, college, this campus does, every campus does. Happens routinely. Um, and usually there's not objections, it depends who's. Usually there's not lawsuits by Robert Mercer threatening to, to you know, attack the academy. Colleges have the right to limit time, place, and manner, and to not allow events that interfere with their educational mission, right? So what they're for, their educational mission to educate students, anything that materially interferes with that is not protected speech. This is the law. All sorts of precedent law for this. When the United... But you're going to be quick. Sorry. When the University of Washington decided to allow Milo to talk and decided to protect this speech far more than many other events, it was saying that it doesn't see the place of marginalized students, Thank students of Thank color, you. queer students as part of its educational mission. Whether it meant to communicate Thank that or you. not, that was absolutely the meaning communicated by that legally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we very likely will be coming back to that because the ideals are a challenge, but the implementation of these ideals are then even more of a challenge. So a deep breath from going through a number of these atrocities, and thank you for calling them to our attention because I, I think uh, so often we don't even know. Um, we have one more panelist um, who has not yet had a chance to share their views. And I want to thank you all for staying with us and staying engaged through these many different views that we've had on our panel. Our final panelist is John Walker. And John is a member of the Industrial Workers of the World which is also the group that the victim of the shooting, Hex, was working with. And John was at the protest when Hex was shot 
and has been in frequent context with, contact with Hex during Hex's recovery. Uh, I think that one of the most surprising things for a lot of people here is that Hex, the victim of the shooting, does not want anyone to go to jail for this. <clears throat> so, John, as much as you can speak for somebody else, I want you to tell us, first of all, I want you to tell us what you think and what you think that we should know, but I hope you can also tell us more about what real justice would look like for Hex, for this hero, in my opinion, who nearly lost his life in this incident. Well, first off, I want to say thanks for having me. Um, and I'm not sure Hex would appreciate being called a hero, but <laughs> um, uh, I kind of want to go through this just by painting uh, two pictures. One, about what I experienced that night, and two, uh, what's gone on since then as far as the conversation on justice and the criminalization of it all. Uh, I'd only been in Seattle for about a year and uh, been involved with the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, if you don't know, it's kind of an all-encompassing union. It uh, has many different facets, but uh, uh, as long as you don't employ anybody, you can join. <laughs> uh, we uh, do take part in a lot of anti-racist work, uh, a lot of community defense, and so we knew that there was going to be a speaker on campus uh, who was going to be saying a lot of things that we didn't agree with. Uh, I had no intention of coming, I had no connections to UWs and no history here, but um, I started the evening out going to the J20 protest downtown. Uh, it's kind of neat, I guess. Uh, kind of got over with really fast, and then I heard that some of our members might be coming up this way. So I uh, hopped on the link and made it up to the university, and just by happenstance ran into Hex, and we ended up walking up to campus together. And we just kind of caught up and talked about what we've been up to. Um, and sure enough, within the hour, the protest started to get going pretty good. Uh, there were a lot of people there. Uh, I've been in some big protests. That was probably one of the bigger ones I'd ever seen. And uh, sure enough, uh, it got very volatile. Uh, I'll say that SPD and UW police did quite a terrible job. <laughs> It was one of the one of the worst de-escalating uh, spaces I've ever seen in my life, and uh, it seemed like they were just about willing to let anything happen. Um, so uh, I had been with Hex for the majority of the the event. Uh, he had decided uh, not to mask up. Uh, uh, there were quite a few people there with uh, face coverings on for their own protection or of their own choosing, whatever their reasons are. Uh, but he also is been a part of actions before and uh, it's not something he wanted to do. Uh, he specifically decided to take on a role of de-escalation throughout the event. Um, and if you don't uh, know, that's just essentially safeguarding the space, making sure people aren't getting beat up, aren't being pepper sprayed, uh, aren't having these violent events happen to them, helping to mediate between people when things go wrong, both between two different groups and within your own group. Uh, I uh, I was kind of a little bit across the square, and that's when we had first identified uh, an individual who was pepper spraying people, um, kind of en masse. Uh, and funny enough, he was also identified right behind me by all of the uh, SPD that were lined up right behind us. Uh, we vocally heard them uh, mark him by his hat, and then. Uh, and then, not in usual fashion, we turned around and asked them if they wanted to come through and take care of the situation. And uh, they declined the offer. Uh, they didn't want to go into the crowd at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, just another example of that. Uh, within about another half hour uh, is when we heard the shot. Uh, I didn't see it. I saw the smoke go up. Uh, but, uh, and then within a few minutes after that, we found out it was Hex. Uh, he was shot, and he was laying there, and medics came to him. Uh, there were protest medics there to take care of him. And they were trying to get help while they were mending him. And sure enough, uh, by the time the police did come over, they decided that uh, they, uh, they didn't want medics on him. They were going to take care of him. So they drug his body onto a golf cart and drove it over Red Square to an ambulance. 
Um, he spent about the next month in the hospital. Uh, and when the detectives came and asked him uh, if he could help them out with their investigation, he said uh, he wasn't going to. And I don't think that these detectives have ever, ever heard that response uh, because they seemed pretty, pretty appalled, uh, they're kind of speechless. Um, uh, I kind of got to know Hex really well after the event and um, learned that we both kind of come from similar communities, uh, very rural, very poor, very white. Um, and in that, we have seen what the criminal justice system can do to that type of community. Um, it, it basically rips it out from underneath. Uh, is, um, yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, these, if anything, the wor it's the worst thing that can happen to a poor white community. Uh, that's where a lot of the most hardcore racists come from. Uh, that's where people get involved in these prison gangs and they come home with swastika tattoos and they want to commit racial genocide and white separatism and it just perpetuates uh, violence in the community. And so if you've seen that and you've lived through it, you know that the system uh, it doesn't really work for anyone. Uh, we talk a lot about how it affects the black community and the brown community, um, and absolutely, disproportionately, it does. But um, it, if you're involved in it, it's going to affect your community no matter what. Uh, and so um, Hex called for a restorative justice process. He, uh, if you don't know, understand what that means, it's a way in the community can come together and figure out how to bring the perpetrator of a crime and the victim of a crime and deal with it between themselves and have a conversation about that without actually involving the state, which kind of is a perpetrator of the crime in itself. Um, and uh, if you were on campus, it's a perfect example of how nothing worked. Um, here you have over 100 police and the whole thing fell apart. Um, so. Uh, he also wanted to have a restorative conversation with um, President Kause, uh that never manifested. And the reason you can't have a restorative process with his, uh, the people who have shot him, or the person who shot him, was because uh, we live in a system where people are so afraid to talk to each other because of a lawsuit or because of uh, any other aspect of our legal system that uh, you, can't, you can't even have that conversation. But it does exist. Uh, restorative justice is a process. Other countries have it. You can meet with someone who has uh, committed a crime against you, and you can begin to build those relationships. Uh, if you don't have that, then you just have a perpetuating system of violence constantly. So uh, that's about all I have to say about it. I want to thank you for that, John, and I want to thank everyone on our panel again. Let's give them all a hand again, please. Thank you. Now, that was a lot. And uh, what I want to do, I was thinking about it when I came in, but also inspired by that comment about how people need to be talking to each other more, is break things up a little bit with some talking to each other. Should we do this? Can we do this? This is very hip in educational in pedagogy. We're going to do active learning. And we're going to do that group work. What we're going to do is having heard a lot of things from a lot of people, while it is still fresh, we're going to focus on what surprised you. And I contend, no matter what your beliefs are when you came in here, I think it's very likely that someone on this panel not only had a belief you would have expected to be different than yours, but also expressed something that you might have found surprising. So I want you to work in small groups. This is the group work time. Just in two or three, if you're feeling really courageous, introduce yourself to someone you don't know and talk to them about this, what surprised you. I'll call us all back together in about seven minutes. And we might report this out. If we have a different color index card, we will circulate those. And I'd like to know about it from you. And the panelists are also invited to do this during your seven minutes. Yes. 
And anyone is allowed to go to the bathroom if they have to. It is upstairs or downstairs. So thank you again. Thank you mostly for returning so that we can now go back to our panel for some more questions. Um, and we have a lot of cards up here. We've been trying to categorize them as you have been talking. And one of the uh, areas that bubbled up for me during the conversation and also had a number of questions is around the role of police. Uh, I wonder if there's panelists who want to speak on this more. I imagine there is a wide range of views about what the appropriate role for police are in a protest situation like this. And I would like to also thank the many people who have this lived experience with this recent event uh, who have shared it already. I don't want to like I don't know, uh, compel sharing beyond what people want or already have. I want to take this in a forward-looking way and with such a range of views on the panel, try to spend some time considering what could it look like in the best and most positive way? What could keep people safer when there are strong, disseparate views on our campus? Uh, is there anyone who'd like to, to take that on for us? And what happened to our mic? <laughs> Let's uh, start with Ruby, and then uh, Sean is also interested. And if other people want to jump on after that, I'll keep an eye. Um, OK. Uh, so let's see. Um, I want to acknowledge that UW PD has a very outsized role on this campus. So they are tasked with uh, managing a huge range of problems um, that we experience. And I think um, policing historically has been super problematic. Like um, different groups have very different experiences with the police. I think we can all agree on that. And UW PD tries to bill itself as this warm, fuzzy, friendly police force, but they're no different than any other police force, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, in light of this, UW has attempted to uh, work on the image of UW PD. Um, they have said that they will have more police officers in plain clothes, still armed, mind you. Uh, but that it, uh, they understand that people are afraid of the police and they think that having them in suits instead of uniforms will alleviate that fear. They also have UW PD passing out cookies on Red Square. Um, I can't make this shit up, <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, so I'm asking for more than Band-Aid reforms. I'm asking for a deep uh, reevaluation of the role that police play on this campus and the role, um, how we can change that role so that people of different races feel equally protected. Thank you. So um, I'll take an extreme stance, um, but then also give something helpful as well. Extremes can be helpful. Um, I'm a police abolitionist and a prison abolitionist. I think it's like been a few hundred years we've tried this. Not most of the time we've been human. We've done other things, and it's not working very well. Um, it's an abject failure, actually, at all the things that it claims to do. So I don't know how to solve it, but I think we got to try. That said, um, I know a lot of the times people who take that stance feel like they should have nothing, no involvement. Um, and generally, that seems like a good idea but it gets tricky in situations like this. Um, and I kind of have been making a distinction lately, some of my friends about abstaining from institutions versus trying to imagine getting rid of them and replacing them with something that we believe in. Those are different questions. Um, so that's one thing that I've thought of in the situation I've never thought of before is, is like how th there are ways that existing institutions, we hate them and we want to replace them and we also depend on them because the alternatives we envision aren't there yet. 
I think the biggest discussions that I've been around for with the police in the situation, um, I mean, I don't, like, I, I study um, and I write about, like, models of, of protest policing, um, and I don't really know what to suggest. I think not interfering in a way has its benefits, and then in that night I'm curious why. I think the, the thing, though, just like, whatever we believe across the board, I think most people would claim, including myself, to believe that, that they should, like, behave consistently and equally to different parties. Um, and I think we've seen this in Berkeley as well. For example, um, there's now recordings of interviews with some of the alt-right people that met in Berkeley that said that they had meetings before with the police. And they told the, the police said, if you go over here, we're going to disarm you. So if you have weapons, don't go over there. But the people resisting the, the, the fascists in Berkeley didn't know that, and they were disarmed, and the, and the alt-right people were not, and that was one reason why the alt-right people got the, the streets of Berkeley. So, you know, that's not fair. <laughs> and I think even, I think across the board, people would recognize that the, the police saying those people can have weapons and these people can't have weapons when they're going to get in a fight opens up interesting questions. The relevant thing that happened here that I've just heard, I've thought obsessively about for four months, and most people I've talked to have as well, was the decision to let the Hokoanas walk. That's just crazy, right? I mean, it's just crazy <laughs> that there was a campus shooting and the shooters turned themselves in and said, we're the campus shooters, and the police said, don't worry about it. I actually had an interesting response. I was noticing a lot of people were like, well, I think they claim self-defense, so maybe the police believe that. When I hear somebody say that, I know that that person has never thought about why we have courts or lawyers or judges, right? And again, I'm a abolitionist. I, I imagine something better, but I certainly would rather have a process than the police decide all of that, right? So that's the first thing is like, what the hell is Don't happening? And I'm going to jump that? in in part because I know you could talk for the whole time we have left. Uh, and I love hearing it, but I'm going to try to make Fair sure enough. that we have a robust discussion. Uh, but to pull out a piece of that, um, what message does it send Absolutely. if the police say, Absolutely. thank you for sharing the gun, and uh, you, we'll get in touch with you if we need anything else? So, so the, some of us close to the situation knew that there was a process, and there was an investigation under play, right? So this is a really good question. And as it turns out, I don't, I'm not actually sure they've pressed charges yet, but they've recommended charges be pressed, and the DA is looking at them. I think they'll be pressed, right? Um, even, though, even though the shooting victim isn't asking for it, the city will. Um, Fine. Um, but the appearance for four months, three months, that there was not going to be charges pressed is what that, I, I didn't get a chance to get all my ideas out, sorry, but the, that was what I see as the main and what a lot of people are seeing locally as the cause of that long list of horrors that I said. Because it sent a really clear message to the ultra-right, to people who were like, here's our time, we're rolling back to the norm of, you know, American white terrorism against minoritized populations to dispossess them of their wealth. Let's go back to that. And they had a perfectly clear message. That's actually what it said. Um, so, you know, whatever, even if there's an investigation going on at the same time, they had to think about that message. That was a terrible idea. I just have to say one more thing on this topic, a third sort of shift. And this is the people I talked to. I know this person, Eric McDavid. I encourage you to look up his case. He was sentenced to 20 years for something he said, right? He didn't hurt anybody. He wasn't even threatening to hurt people. He said something about we should protect Mother Earth, and he got entrapped by an FBI agent. And he was sentenced for 20, 20 years for what he said. And after 11 years, the FBI acknowledged the misdeed and let him out. Only 11 years in federal prison. Look up his case, Eric McDavid. Uh, Josh um, Harper, I mentioned before, locally, um, again, was sentenced for years in prison for something he said that was not threatening to people. He said, he said, like, um, fact, uh, sorry, businesses that cause animal suffering should pay economic consequences. And for that, it was linked to terrorism. Um, he didn't do it, but just from those values that he put out there, and he spent years in prison for that, right? Milo has said that feminism is cancer, Islam is cancer. He was cheering on how campus rape um, brings out the best in Western civilization because it's about masculine aggression. Um, Milo is an example, oh, yeah, I have it, we could look at it later. Milo is an example of direct physical threats against people in his speech. He gave, at the last several speeches he gave, he had this thing called trigger cam where he played on a screen people who were opposing him with crosshairs on their head. That's a direct physical threat to somebody. That is not protected speech by the 
Planned Parenthood of Willamette Valley versus American Coalition of Life Activists uh, findings, that's not protected speech to threaten somebody with a real threat, even if it's understood in a certain context, right? That so I just want to point more. out the unequal application of the law, the unequal application, no matter what we think in the end of police and courts and our, you know, all these things, we have to be shocked by the unequal application of these institutions. Thank you. I'm jumping in there <laughs> in a loving way. Thank you, Sean. But I think this point of what is equal, are, are there other people who want to speak on this police before we go on? Anna Sophia, please, and then um, I'll come back to it. Excuse me if, I already, if Ruby already covered this. I walked in a little late into um, what she was saying. But I think it's also worth mentioning um, when talking about training UW police. Um, what, one of the things I found troubling in my reporting of um, the online harassment of Alan Michael, um, as well as other students um, in the aftermath of the Inauguration Day protests, was that the UWPD, to me, seemed to have a very clear misunderstanding of how online harassment works. Um, and I think that that is a training that is absolutely necessary in an age where we all have phones on us all the time, where people are recording us all the time, where, um, where pe social media runs our lives, essentially. I think understanding how online harassment can start um, and, under, and knowing how it can spread outside of your own state, outside of your own city, um, to lead to death threats, to lead to threats of sexual assault, um, among other things. Um, those threats, while someone from Kansas might be making them to someone here in Seattle, um, can still ve feel very real in an online age where the internet can help mobilize people, um, as we again saw at the Milianopolis protest. Um, in which people came from out of the state to come demonstrate. Um, so again, I just wanted to put that out there that all types of law enforcement agencies, as well as school administration, such as President Anna Marie Kase, need to be literate in um, how the internet works and how online harassment can start. Oh, you were asking for the mic to uh, jump in on that. Uh, well. Should we ask for a little bit more from an ACLU lawyer on this matter who is also a technology lawyer? I think we should. I think we should put you on the spot if you have anything to add to that because it seems like you're dealing with this day to day. Are there things that are different that we need to know about how technology functions and harassment functions now? I think that's a really tough question that I don't have a great answer to, but um, it's, it comes up and I've the law is continuing to grapple with it. And to give an example of my other case that I talked about that I actually lost, which was this bus advertising case, I, one of our, an argument that we had was, hey, the people in King County don't really care about this Israeli foreign policy bus ad. It was really people outside of King County and there was like an email campaign that um, was mounted against this bus ad. And um, although the, the court ultimately didn't, didn't agree with this, argument, I, I think it definitely slightly resonated with at least one of the judges that, hey, it's so easy to mount an online campaign now that anything could be going on anywhere and I could, you know, with enough people and, a, and a, an email list, I could generate what looks like a wave of protest and what looks like a bunch of people locally who are opposed to a particular issue and sort of drawing the line between, you know, where where's somebody from Kansas making a threat versus who's in King County is a, is a tough thing to do. And um, I think the online harassment qu question also is a really, really difficult one. And um, there's, there's not a lot of good, there's not a lot of great answers. I mean, undoubtedly, sp just the fact that it's speech is doesn't mean it's off limits. I think speech can be harmful and, um, you know, there are some First Amendment absolutists who say, well, speech is speech, and regardless of how harmful it is, it's not, it can't be off limits. I'm, I'm probably not one of those people. I think I'll acknowledge that, you know, in the workplace or in the school, repeated um, offensive uh, remarks can affect the experience of different types of people who are in the workplace or who are in the schools. But um, 
I think that said, the 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 online question throws a huge new wrinkle into it that I, I just I don't have a great answer to, but it, it's coming up more and more in in cases, and I think over time it'll be interesting to see how the how the courts deal with it. Uh, thank you. So one other thing that uh, was coming up when Sean was speaking earlier, and is in a number of these questions, uh, and ties into I think what Alan Michael was talking about earlier, is about let's say inequality in the different actors who are involved in all of this uh, and um, I think you know the question I guess is does the observation is the ACLU and college Republicans have a similar perspective on free speech uh, which when we talk about things that surprise us I, I was surprised that is how I was expecting things to shake out and I think that uh, perhaps they were also uh, who knows it shows anyway to, to focus on the point I was trying to get to um, is there's something about differences in power and the fundamental inequalities between people that we are not taking into account when we think about free speech. And Sean mentioned this a little bit in terms of platforms, but I think that in, for me it was bubbling up a little bit also in the repeated acknowledgement that there are no black students or people of color from the university on our panel. Um, and I, I think this is complicated, and I wonder if there are panelists who can uh, start digging into it for us and unpacking it a little bit more. I imagine that's more for me. Um, and in part, this is, I mean, I teach post-colonial studies and queer of color studies. In part, that's what I was kind of brought to the university to do um, as a grad student and pursue that research. Um, and one of the things that we work on, especially in liberalism, is thinking through liberalism as an ideology that was a response to, again, the fall of the monarchies um, in establishing the state and law, the right of law. Um, and I think it's important for us to be very critical of our language use, to know where certain terms come from, to situate them within their historical contexts. Um, because a lot of times we use the language of liberalism now without being very critical about how it affects our thinking. So when we say things like people and we say things like we, um, I was also going to write in my thing about the uncritical use of we that is in there because of course we all experience things in different ways because of our intersecting identities. There is no universal we. Um, and so when we think about things like humanity, it's very important to remember that liberalism um, believed that one is free insofar as one owns property. Um, that, that's the crux. Um, so what does that mean, say for instance, for women that are not property? They weren't free. Um, people of color were not free, especially when liberalism was joined with the colonization of the Americas. Um, and not only that, but what does that mean for indigenous people that don't even conceive of property ownership at all? Um, so they are not free. Um, but because of colonization, which is the forced imposition of that ideology on the rest of the world, those of us that are minoritized then buy into that project. Um, and that's now the kind of predicament that we're in now because some of us forget those histories Some of us are uncritical of that language use um, There are tons of minoritized people that say humanity too and they believe it right and that's why we have to do what we call decolonizing that and situating things in their historical contexts, but liberalism is a command of language that is abstract universalized decontextualized and dematerial um, it cannot think through issues of labor, um, and that's why I wanted to free, reframe the conversation around labor, because it's basically like you're still stuck in the same maze trying to figure out the problem, but now I'm giving you Ariadne's thread. Um, 
I just want to point out that any discussions of free speech fall short if we don't talk about the fact that undocumented students cannot safely assemble and share their lived experiences on this campus because they have experienced such brutal harassment, doxing, threats. So if we're talking about truly free speech, we need to talk about free speech for everyone, including people who historically and continually are marginalized and do not have access to the most basic freedoms. University of Washington is also 3.5% African American, last I checked, in a county that I think is 12% African American. So that's probably a reason. Also, well, there's no black folks in the room, I think. Sorry if I'm wrong. Um, so that matters, right? And just, there's all sorts of social reasons for that um, that are extremely important. The school to prison pipeline, the inequality in our schools, um, and the kind of things that are considered in admissions, et cetera, et cetera. Also, just to be clear, uh, people who've been speaking out on this stuff have experienced really intense harassment. Alan Michael, most of all, most publicly, but there's been a lot more. There's been dozens of people who've got death threats and really direct harassment. It's a pain in the ass enough for us uh, with, I mean, us say, oh my God, me with white privilege. And it's like potentially deadly considering other things that are happening for people of color. So that is obviously a reason for it. I think also just to add on to that as someone who is biracial, um, who does get to walk with a lot of white privilege or not being so brown as I might be perceived by other people. Um, I think it's important to also acknowledge that students of color, undocumented students, queer, trans, LGBTQ plus students, um, lots of us constantly feel like we walk around with um, a target on our backs. Um, and I think asking us to speak up while it's important to hear our voices, we also have to understand the reasons why people don't want to or feel uncomfortable in doing so. Um, because there is the threat of being doxxed um, or being harassed more than usual. <laughs> There's all kinds of subtle harassment that people of color, queer people, etc., <laughs> um, ex um, experience every single day. And a lot of that's passive and probably not intentional, but to people with, the, with these lived experiences, these are harmful things that we experience every day. Um, what, is there anyone else who wants to speak in on this one? Uh, one thing that I would like to bring up is about a UW policy. Uh, and this sounds a little bit boring, but I think it will lead us to interesting discussion. Because while a lot of this, uh, what we have to do, is based on our role as a public university and our responsibilities uh, under constitutional laws, we are also an institution that has our own policies. And to me, this could connect to a restorative justice process. This gives us mechanism for trying out things that we think could do better than the approaches that uh, are in society, more broader society at large. Uh, if you go to the policy on violence in the workplace, you'll hear that UW does not tolerate behaviors direct or through the use of university facilities, properties, or resources that, and then there's a list of things that actually you might think are in conflict with some of these free speech values, is violent, threatens to harm, harasses or intimidates others, interferes with an individual's legal right of movement or expression, disrupts the workplace, the academic environment, or the university's ability to provide services to the public. Well, I'll finish this one and then switch to that because it's clear that that is something that would be appreciated by multiple people in the audience. But this one, which does relate to some of the questions and comments, I think 
is impossible. How do we pick between these things? And there's a fundamental conflict between uh, our commitment. Uh, anyway, I don't have to belabor the point. Let's make sure there's room for many of these questions and comments. But please, if there is anything that people think would help us through this maze, uh, let me know. So I think, so again, thinking about situating things in their historical contexts, um, we have to think about the university as a project too that came out of the European um, state project as well. Um, Immanuel Kant actually wrote a really great piece called Conflict of the Faculties, um, which was about the university project when it first began and how it kind of threatened the authority of the kings. Um, but they colluded with the government, actually, to produce knowledge for the government in order to better regulate the populace. Um, now what that does when it is all about liberalism and the free exchange of ideas, again, only for those who are considered human and actually people, which locks out all minoritized folks, um, what this does is it produces the logical contradiction. Uh, again, that's what I was talking about, is the logical contradiction of capital. Um, and what happens is that we want, again, the minoritized labor, but we don't want to put our money where our mouths are to actually give them the, act, the support when, again, they come under fire and so forth. Um, so when we raise the question that the university is contradictory, I kind of think, well, yeah, no shit it's part of that project and that whole project is riddled with logical contradictions um, because it cannot think about materiality at all um, and so again I one of the courses that I taught was Complet 200 which was a critical comparative kind of survey of the university as it moved into the Americas and ours is a research university so again it's in its public it's meant to produce research for the state um, it's quite different from a Jesuit university, which was picked up in uh, the Latin American um, countries and so forth. Um, but these projects are quite different, and we should know their histories. So I'm, I'm struggling with something about um, how Milo's invitation is affecting students. And I think it's a valid and very interesting point. And what my question that I'm just kind of thinking to myself is, do, is the fact of inviting Milo causing some sort of harm to students separate from any actions that Milo or his entourage might take? And to me, that's a kind of a critical question that I'm, I think that's kind of what this whole panel is sort of raising. And, you know, from a free speech standpoint, I think the answer is relatively straightforward, and I think we've heard a lot of good critiques about, you know, maybe maybe we shouldn't embrace that, and maybe we should be looking at it from a different lens. To me, from a free speech from a free speech standpoint, there's no sort of seal of approval from the UW because Milo's here. I mean, there's there's hundreds of speakers that come through UW. A club is inviting a particular speaker if they want to invite whomever, so be it, right? There's probably a Satanist club that wants to invite, you know, people who are doing all, whatever. You get the idea. So I think when I, when I hear of Milo's invitation causing harm, I think that's an interesting point that uh, I'm very curious about. And, and I don't want to be simplistic and say it would surprise me to hear people claim that people are harmed just because Milo's getting invited, but I think that that's still a pretty interesting distinction between his invitation to speak versus what is he actually doing? I mean, is he, is he pointing to people in the audience and, you know, causing them to get beaten up after the fact, metaphorically or literally, or, um, and it sounds like there's kind of a spread of, of, um, of, of views on whether or not that occurred, but I think that's still an interesting sort of uh, line in the sand that uh, that needs to be drawn that I'm very curious about that I don't have an answer to but um, kind of going back to your question about the policy uh, I don't think they give a damn about their own policies uh, 
Kalse uh, specifically said in an interview, uh, I feel lucky the victim didn't die after getting shot. Um, I don't think she felt lucky for Hex. I think she felt lucky that a stream of lawsuits weren't going to come in. I think she felt lucky that donors weren't going to come knocking. I think the Board of Regents probably felt super lucky that uh, they weren't going to go down in percentage points and how many students came to the university. Uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, it's probably not the safest place to say this, but our universities are not institutions that stand by their values and policies. They're education mills, diploma mills, as we like to say. And uh, they're worried about numbers and money. They're not worried about the human cost. Um, and I think it, the, the shooting itself speaks to that. Um, so I'll stand by what I said. I don't think they care one single bit. Um, and they're going to take whatever position they can to, to get out of it. Uh, and again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about restorative justice. This is about trying to weave themselves through a legal system that is going to constantly be barraging them and not actually uh, stand up for what's right. Yeah, I absolutely agree from my experience that UW does not stand by its own policies. Um, so after the shooting, I spoke with a representative of President Kause's office, um, Margaret Shepard. Um, she's one of, um, I understand, uh, Mar uh, President Kause's right-hand people. Um, and I said there's a UW policy, um, or actually a state policy, that bans firearms on campus. And I asked if that was going to be enforced in the case of the shooter. And I was told that they would not enforce this policy because they were afraid of lawsuits from the gun lobby. So, um, yeah, I think this just speaks to the fact that these policies might be in writing, they're not enforced. Um, and I felt chastised, like, how dare you ask us to enforce our policies because we could have lawsuits. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad we got to this because um, I feel like this is absolutely key to, to answering the question that is asked by the panel. Um, first of all, as one, as one follow up on what both of you brought up, um, if anyone watches where the money comes and goes to the university, we are patching all the holes in the, in the hole with international students who often pay two to three times the tuition of in-state. Guess what? Because of this, that tu those tuition numbers are, are plummeting. In fact, the IELP where I used to teach, um, which is this is scandalous, I'm not supposed to say this, but I'll say it. Um, where, where people come to learn English um, in a UW environment has had about a 50% drop in enrollment. That's the money that keeps the college open. So congratulations, your white supremacist school won't stay open very long if that's what happens, which is another reason why this is all of our concern. If you care about the university being open, that means it has to be open for everybody, because also that's where the money comes from, which is kind of messed up, but that's another conversation. Um, I think that this is the absolute key, and I think, as a, as a I'm gonna switch hats for a little bit, um, as a cultural analyst, the problem isn't Milo. The problem is I've been following, I'm like doing Antifa stuff, and I've been doing this for like 20, 30 years. I'm from Sacramento, where we had a very active militant neo-Nazi movement. The problem is the grounds that Milo opens up. There's not many Milos out there. As most of you probably know, Milo is gay and Jewish. Most Nazis are not gay and Jewish, at least both. Um, <laughs> um, so it's what he made speakable. And what I think is an interesting thing that we should go home with is the question, you know, like, I don't think the university would have a Holocaust denial conference, I hope. And why not? Because it's a settled question, and opening up that question is like a, is a social move. And I don't know why it's one that we should do. Milo is making similar moves. Milo is saying that people don't deserve to be in this country because of their skin color. Milo is saying, even if he's gay, that he believes gay people need to suffer forcible conversion, and trans people especially. Like, those are closed issues, I thought. But he opened them, and that's what bringing Milo meant folks who brought Milo. That's what it meant. It's not this one guy. Nobody cares what this one, he, if you watch his speech, it's like empty of content. It's that he can get away with being totally openly racist, totally openly like, basically he's saying this isn't for everybody anymore. This is just for us. That was, we had the presumption for a few decades at least. And you know, it's complicated. 
but we thought that that was off the table. Milo and Richard Spencer and a few other fools who like, nobody actually likes these Nazi guys, they don't like them, but they're using them to open up the conversation. Do we want that conversation opened? And I will say from being, now I'm gonna switch hats again and say when I was a protester on Red Square, I was actually sneaky and I was trying to get in and I was dressed nicely, uh, not in protester gear. Um, and I was listening to a lot of the conversations around me. Um, I've never seen so many like organized veteran white supremacist activists in one place as I saw in Seattle on the University of Washington campus, J20. Those people don't, I mean, some of them live in the outskirts. Some of them came across the country for it. Why did they come? Because a lot of other campuses said this is a bad idea, but University of Washington decided after months, after all these warnings, that those things were open for conversation again. So when we talk about free speech, you can't talk about it without saying free speech about what? And do we really want to go where we're opening questions about whether some people deserve to be here because of skin color or not? That's, what's it, that's what the question is, so I hope everybody takes that question home and really takes it seriously. Um, please. Thank you, Sean. I think, I think an interesting... I think a really interesting point was, was just brought up, and um, that's free speech about what? And do we want to open those conversations, uh, conversations about things like racism and sexism and, and really, uh, I think, topics that most of us, I think, I think almost everyone in this room, if not all of us, uh, would say racism is wrong, sexism is wrong. I think the problem is that by saying those conversations are closed, what we really mean is this is a certain interpretation of what sexism is. This is an interpretation of what racism is. And so the problem is who gets to decide that the issue is an issue that we do not want to open? Um, and, and I don't think you can find an authority that will be able to say this topic is closed um, that won't do so in a manner that institutionalizes or, or agrees with inherently a certain interpretation of, uh, of what racism means. Because I, think, I don't think any of us would say that everyone is on the same page about what is racist. I don't think any of us would say that we're all on the same page about what is sexist. I think we all have very different interpretations of what that means. So to say that we should close conversations that we believe uh, open up uh, the opportunity for dangerous ideologies, I believe is even more dangerous than the dangerous ideologies that may become uh, presented as a result of those conversations. And, and that's what the position the college Republicans are taking is that we pose a, a greater threat to society by, uh, by closing conversations than we do by exposing racism and other ideologies that we that we know are immoral and wrong um is by 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 not exposing those and by trying to shut down the conversations we actually aren't going to get rid of those those bad uh presences in society and the only way to improve our society and make sure that uh racism and sexism and homophobia and all of those other uh ills of society are, are eradicated is by exposing the people that ascribe uh, or subscribe to those philosophies and having conversations that, uh, that debunk um, those ideologies. And, and, and so that is why it's far better to open the conversation and allow the majority who have reasonable, logical, and moral uh, convictions about these issues than it is to shut down the conversation because we're afraid of uh, the opinions that might come forth. We are nearing the end of the time that we have allotted for this. Please pass the mic over to Alan Michael. And are there other panelists who would like to uh, weigh in on this? because I do want to be mindful of time, and I do want to thank you all for being part of this very wide range of opinions. Uh, you look exhausted. <laughs> Hang in there, let's hear from Alan Michael, and I will then close things out, and thank you all. And so I, I use two important um, expressions, uh, I guess I can call them. One is the cultivation of ignorance, and then the second is knowledge production. Um, and I think it's quite telling that we use sometimes the, the linguistic terms interpretation and opinion, 
which manifests yet another logical contradiction of the liberal university. Because if everybody just has their own interpretation and opinions, I'm really not sure how we even fulfill the notion of progress if we're all just sitting around interpreting things as we choose. Right? It, so it exposes the logical contradiction of even liberalism that believes in its own progress. Um, and so when we say, yes, we might have all different interpretations of racism and sexism, what I want to point out again is the cultivation of that ignorance. There's a difference between interpretations and opinions and scholarly work, and work that has been done over and again and has been checked. Um, and that's why I'm asking you today to think about when you say racism and sexism, whose work does that come from? Have you read their work? Have you read the material and the theories that they have built off of that? They aren't simply interpretations. Um, they're actually scholarly work. And when you don't engage in that, you are participating in the cultivation of that ignorance that is one of the demands of liberal capital. I think this is the perfect place to wind things down. So remember all of the things that surprised you, the people you talked to about them, and let us thank all of our panelists one more time. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'd like to briefly tell you about additional events. If you want more, there is a talk that AAUP is co-sponsoring this Thursday with the Faculty Senate and others uh, entitled Teaching in Times of Turmoil, Understanding State Ethics, Academic Freedom, and Free Speech. This talk will be Thursday, May 25th from 3.30 to 5 p.m. in Savory 260. Also, the Faculty Forward is hosting a panel discussion on faculty rights in the new political era, and this will be followed by a clinic from the Electronic Frontier Foundation on digital privacy and digital rights. This event is scheduled for Thursday, June 1st from 4 to 6 p.m. in Smith 105. Let's now thank the organizers of this panel one more time because without them putting it together, this couldn't have happened. And thank you all so much for coming. Thanks.